Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our AI and automation live chat special with me, your host, Sally Eves. And of all the tech pairings within today's age of tech convergence, as I like to call it, I think AI and automation together was a leading catalyst for innovation for business and society too. So today, I'm delighted to explore this deep dive session with John Christoph Lanieri, Head of AI and Cognitive Networks at BCSS within Ericsson. Welcome, Jean Christoph or JC. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Our absolute pleasure. And such a fascinating area, this. So perhaps as a way to start, John Christoph, perhaps to share a little bit more about your role and in particular what this area covers. Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. So I think, you know, if, if you think about how our telecom operators are running their business today, it's uh, all about business transformation with automation, with AI powered automation. You know, just imagine moving processes from a very labor intensive to AI powered operations. Uh, this is really what Ericsson Cognitive Network Solution is about. We support customers with services to operate and optimize networks around the world. And we are helping them in the transformation to an AI data driven and zero touch operation. Absolutely. For, for me, I think this represents this enablement layer in so many different ways and really putting forward that active intelligence, whether it's for productivity benefits or operational costs, or whether it's efficiency, sustainability, scalability, you name it. It really is the enablement for, for these types of achievements. So within telecoms itself, and again, I think this sector catalyst for innovation for so many other verticals in society. What does this mean within telecoms specifically? Can we drill into that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, uh, 5G represents a huge tipping point for the telecom industry, right? Like, uh, if you look at today, you know, we're going to be roughly 1.5 billion uh, 5G subscribers by the end of the year, according to Ericsson Mobility Report. But that's a still a very tiny part compared to the 7.4 billion MBB mobile broadband subscribers in the world, right? So we are going through a massive transition today. 16 gigabyte per month on average for smartphone. We're going to go to 97, 58 gigabyte per month in Northeast Asia and India in 2028. So it's it's a mass massive shift that is happening from an industry perspective. The networks are becoming much more complex with a lot of different topology complexities, a lot of different frequency bands, a lot of different kind of um, radios being deployed. And I think we're at a tipping point where the network complexity and the, uh, let's say, the solutions that AI is enabling are really meeting each other, right? Like this is where AI can really enable a better performance, a better return for operators, and at the same time, enable cost efficiency, capex efficiency, and uh, of course, a much more effective operation. Couldn't agree more. And again, it's that is convergence, isn't it, what we're looking at here. And in terms of this smart technology benefits as well, you mentioned a few there in terms of where this adoption of AI will make a difference. And again, looking at this from the network up, I think another area that springs to mind is also areas around ESG and sustainability benefits too. Because again, there's another vector of change, great opportunity here to lead this from the network up. Um, and equally as well, new compliance requirements and demands and accountability about delivering on this too. So I wonder what your view is of that, JC, about role of telecoms and ESG and AI can make a difference here too? I think it can make a tremendous difference. Just imagine if you can go from uh, testing the network with drive test, i.e. people driving around with cars, to virtual drive test, meaning that the AI is collecting network data, analyzing the data to be able to uh, achieve same or better results, right? Uh, it means that you can cut 80% CO2 per year uh, with virtual drive test. I mean, this is tangible uh, result that the AI solution that we bring to market can give to, to customer. Um, so in general, I think we we are all about breaking the energy curve uh, in uh, in Ericsson. And, uh, you know, of course, a, a lot of the majority, let's say, of the energy spent is on the infrastructure. But here we can affect, to a great extent, how the infrastructure is using energy with the kind of solution that we have by operating the network in a much more efficient manner with a less labor intensive um, uh, paradigm and also with the solution that enable us to uh, remove site visits or remove driving, for example, in, in, the, in different countries. 
couldn't agree more. And I'll tell you what as well, what we'll do in the show notes too is put a link to, to the Ericsson report about breaking the sustainability curve as well, because it's packed with insights here. And literally what you were saying there, JC, as well, is we have to address this holistically. It's across software, it's across half, hardware. And also in that research, you drill into some of your work around materials use, radio design, antenna design, etc. as well. So it really does address it from a holistic point of view. So I think really fantastic asset there. So we'll definitely link to that too. And then back to our main focus today, I wonder if we could drill a little bit more around the how so looking at these cognitive network solutions and what you're doing at Ericsson to address some of the challenges to convert those to opportunities yeah sure so I mean if you if you think about it uh, you know the way we have been operating networks and optimizing networks uh, has pretty much been the same in the last 20, 25 years right like uh, typically engineering teams look at you know the data what problems do we have in the network? We look at potential root cause analysis. Why do we have a problem? We look at solutions. You know, we test those solutions, and of course, we we kind of implement the different solutions, uh, parameter changes or configuration changes on the network. Right? It's just that those steps are uh, typically very manual. Right? Like it requires a lot of manual work to be able to to do those changes. Um, uh, and I think what we're doing, what we're focusing on from a cognitive network solution perspective is to build a number of applications that can automate those steps from the analysis to the root cause analysis to understanding solution, recommendation, or even for that matter, closing the loop and, uh, let's say, uh, doing the network changes required to be able to improve a certain problem for, for, for the customer. So this is where our investments are going, right, from an R&D perspective uh, on building these, uh, these kind of applications, these kind of solutions. Uh, we have good proof points uh, already on more than 50 customers globally, right, like where we're using those different solutions. Uh, and we see that, you know, we have tangible, uh, let's say, um, uh, benefits, not only from an automation perspective, but on the fact that because now the AI can look at the entire network and all the data, uh, we can actually improve the performance of the network, i.e. the user experience, the consumer experience for, for, for the end user significantly, more than double digits. So I think we're, we're feeling quite confident about you know, the, the kind of benefits we can give for not only for the CSPs, but for the end users uh, that you know, are, are, are using their smartphones or their devices uh, every day. Love that. I think three words, self-learning at scale, are ringing through my ears as you're talking there, Jesse. I love that, really do. But also the fact that this human-machine partnership, if you will, is addressing so many areas that are challenges, you know, not just in telecoms, but in many other verticals too. So around... Um, complexity probably number one but also visibility integration but also things around like alert overload and um, overload in certain ops teams and things like that as well so this is really enabling that kind of higher order thinking and the active intelligence I mentioned earlier as well so love that fantastic and I know you mentioned already about customers using this in action right now and a few of those benefits particularly around experience I wonder if we could share a little bit more details of some of the I think 13 million sites this has already been deployed to and optimized but we could drill into a few of those use cases of who's using this now and what benefits they're seeing it'd be fantastic to kind of bring this to life for the audience yeah sure i mean as you said you know last year we we optimized more than 13 million sites you know globally i think that's uh, that's a proof point of of uh, of this solution uh, we have a number of tier one customers uh, tier one operators large operators uh, globally both in let's say north america and asia and Europe that are leveraging the solutions to uh, improve improve their performance. Um, and I think it, it all comes down to, uh, let's say, uh, number one, uh, exposing the data, right, that is in the network. Uh, I think it's it's a lot of work on from, from the customers on enabling an architecture that will, uh, that will um, uh, put forward such exposure, right? Like, um, and uh, as a second step, let's say, how do we leverage that data exposure with our solutions and how do we automate a certain amount of workflows, right? Like, um, uh, I think, you know, this is what we see uh, our lead customers uh, working on at the moment. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it, it it seems some things are very tangible, right? If you take, you know, what an engineering team is doing today, um, you know, you, you typically have division of, you know, different tasks, right? Like, uh, and the tool, the tool can really uh, automate these kind of different workflows. For example, okay, maybe you have an interference problems. Okay, the tool can recommend, okay, these are the sites that have interference problems. Uh, you can dispatch 
uh, a team to go and hunt for that interference in the field. Or maybe you have a configuration problem and the knock can uh, uh, resolve that problem by uh, enabling the right features or changing the configuration for, for these different sites, right? Like, so it's really about automating, you know, and linking the insights from the AI solution that we have with the different workflows that operators have and enabling that more and more of them can be uh, fully uh, automated and closed loop listen. Fantastic. Love that. And again, you naturally brought out many of the benefits there. That that use case, I think, is, is superb. And I wonder if we could just drill into one or two more. So we've already talked about experience. I'd love to mention partnerships. You know, fresh back from MWC Americas recently. And again, that power of the community to address changes, but cloud native and AI native right up there as key talking points. So I think this power of community to its for action, I'd love to drill into that. But from your take, it's like kind of the top three kind of main benefits of this solution, kind of beyond the experience, I think would be fantastic. So definitely like leadership partnerships and transformation overall. I'd love to drill into a few of those areas. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, if we look at um, uh, the, the solution that we have, right, like um, if we look at the AI solution, I think we, we I think are investing a lot on, on building globally trained models from very different markets, right? Like, uh, and we have, you know, key insights from you know, this exposure, this global exposure, but we can also retrain these models with um, uh, with the data from one specific operator in a given market. Uh, we are flexible. You know, we realize that this, um, this area is very close to the operations team from the customer, meaning that we need to be adaptable uh, and we have built a number of APIs uh, that allows uh, customers to be able to build um, and feed, let's say, other systems and tools, you know, from the insight that we generate. Um, I think we also uh, uh, put a lot of emphasis on building trust with engineering teams, right? Like, uh, and to do that, we have what we call explainable AI, right? It means that not only the AI will spit out a recommendation, it will also tell you why we have this recommendation, what is the problem that we're solving, uh, so that we can build that trust with the engineering team so that the engineering teams can leverage those kind of solutions uh, more and more, right? Like, um, so these are maybe three kind of like key elements that we see. We see that, you know, as a consequence, we're improving more than double digit, you know, the, 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 the performance in number of networks, you know, 40% uplink throughput improvement in some, you know, mega events recently, uh, less customer complaints. Uh, we can solve resolution time, you know, res you know, reduce resolution time, but more than 70% in some certain workflows, right? Like, um, so I think we see that, you know, this, the fact that we digitalize these workflows, the fact that we integrate our AI insights, uh, you know, with, uh, the customer workflows really enable great uh, benefits for, for the operations. Super. Thank you, JC. And as we come towards the end of, of the discussion today, perhaps two final pillars to focus on. One, how would you describe how Ericsson's solution is a differentiator, perhaps potentially from an intellectual property point of view? I'd love to do that. And then as a final one, perhaps a final couple of case studies that we can show where people can go and follow up on where this has been delivered in action. I'd love to kind of end it like that, if I may. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, so I think you know we we are partnering with you know hundred plus customers, right? Like uh, on building this um, uh, this portfolio, we are of course investing in R and D. Uh, uh, we have you know uh, more than four hundred uh, research engineers uh, in the field of AI. We you know the the R and D team building this portfolio is as big. So, so I think we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on building technology leadership in that field uh, in, in the telecom world, right? Like, uh, and associated with that um, comes the, the the IP that we're that we're building. Um, I think it's it's uh, uh, very tangible from our perspective. Uh, you know, I was just two weeks ago. I was in Copenhagen at um, uh, at DDW where I was on stage with. Um, uh, our friends from Morido in Qatar, where we ran a big mega event December last year, and where both of us were talking about how these kind of solution really enable not only uh, a really fast turnaround between the teams, but it enabled better performance. And it also enabled the fact that we could look at the network in its entirety, right? So you get scale, right? You get scale, you get consistency, and you get quality. Uh, I think this is what we're focusing on, uh, and this is where we're investing in terms of capital allocation, and uh, and this is where 
uh, we, we're going to work on with customers uh, in the next few quarters. Superb. I love that. I love that holistic nature that you brought to the fore there. The unique intellectual property, the experience, the trusted partnership, power of ecosystem, reducing that complexity that's inherent today as well. So absolutely, it's kind of making the best networks better, isn't it? I couldn't agree more. So JC, thank you so much for spending time today, really drilling into this and particularly sharing those powerful examples of this in action already. So I think that's so valuable for audiences to see. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great pleasure. My pleasure too. And thank you to everyone for watching and listening too. We'll be back for another episode very soon. Thanks for joining us.